Welcome. Welcome to Business 101, Introduction to Business Online with Professor Joe Lane. Now I am so motivated because we just came out of chapter 10 talking about motivation and now we're in chapter 11, Human Resource Management. <laughs> Why am I so motivated? This is the last chapter in Unit 2. Chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. These are our management chapters. You know, Business 210, which you'll be probably taking in the next semester or two. We're kind of getting a taste of what management is all about. And so this will be our last chapter before we take uh, test number two. And that means we are halfway through this summer semester. Boy, it does go quickly, doesn't it? It really does. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about human resource management. Well, first of all, let's talk about human resources. Well, what are human resources? That's the employees of a company, huh? A company has, a company's got trucks, a company has desk, a company has buildings, a company has paper, computers, and they're all resources of that company. But 99.9% .9 of the time, in most companies, what's the number one resource they have? Well, if that company has employees, that's going to be the number one resource. Because those employees are the ones that's going to make that paper, and that equipment, and that truck, and that desk, and that building come alive for that company so that company can make a profit. Managers at all levels have to realize that the greatest resource, or another term we'll use is asset. The greatest asset that a company has is its employees. And if you are as a manager, most of the time, almost always, a manager cannot be successful without the people they manage. They're the ones that's going to be doing it. If your department needs to accomplish a goal, if your business needs to accomplish a goal, if your store needs to accomplish a goal, whatever it is that you're involved with, it's going to be your employees that's going to probably make that happen. So managers manage people, and people are incredibly important. Okay, uh, I want to beat that de to death a little bit because it, it, uh, it really is important to set the stage for how important the management of your human resources is all. You know, it's all, it's all about that and how important it is. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you, here's some good news right off the bat. The definition of human resource management, since this is a whole chapter on human resource management, are we going to have to know that definition or be familiar with it? And if you have been with me through these videos, you're thinking, let's be familiar with, let's be familiar with, that's a big long definition. Okay, so let's be familiar with the definition of human resource management, which is okay done, but not beautifully done on your chapter, uh, chapter 11 handout. Human resource management. Uh, I actually didn't even put what it was, I just kind of started it with that. It's the process, so you know human resource management is ongoing, is ongoing. It's the process of first determining human resource needs, then recruiting, selecting, developing, motivating, evaluating, compensating, and scheduling employees to meet organizational goals. And remember, we are moving more now from a, have moved from a manufacturing goods producing uh, nation economy to a service uh, centered economy. So most companies and most employees are engaged now in the service industry. All right, uh, what I've done is this is my little, I guess you could call it a line chart or a line graph as it relates to human resource management. Human resource management has to do with finding selecting, hiring, training, 
evaluating and retaining employees. In retaining employees, you're talking about compensation and, you know, as, as you looked at the definition, uh, the process of determining human resource needs and then recruiting, selecting, developing, motivating, evaluating, compensating, and scheduling employees to meet organizational goals. So I think this is just kind of a neat little, uh, a, a neat little, uh, I guess you could call it a bar graph or something like that. When I, I write my book on management and I get to the uh, chapter on human resource management, that's going to be the first thing on my first page. All right. Now I, I want to go back again for a second and say human resource management is ongoing all the time. And you certainly could understand from here on, are you continually, when should you start training your employees when they first come to work for you? When should you quit training your employees when they leave your service? You should continually train professional development your employees, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But this training, appraising, retaining, the things you do to evaluate, the things you do to keep your employees, you know these things are, are certainly continuous. But what about here? Are we gonna be continually over time finding and selecting employees? Well, the answer is sure. But wait a minute, I'm gonna hire good employees and I'm going to treat them right so that they'll stay with me. That's what you need to do. But does that mean you're going to eliminate this or is this going to be going on all the time as well? Well, sure it is. Why? Why do people leave a company? Well, sometimes people just change careers. Sometimes find, people find a better job even though you're doing your best somewhere else. Sometimes people just leave the workforce. Sometimes people are deceased. Sometimes people retire. Sometimes people get transferred from one place to another and you've got to find someone to fill the job where they transferred from. So this is an ongoing type of thing. Now, you don't start out looking for folks. What are you going to do today? I'm going to go out and see if I can find some folks for this company. Oh, okay. Where are you going to look? Everywhere. What kind of folks are you looking for? All kinds. Well, you're going to be looking everywhere and you're going to be trying to find all kinds of folks for what, for what jobs? I don't know. I just know that I'm supposed to be out there finding people. Well, not really. That's not where you start. You don't start out there by looking. You start out by determining your human resource needs. And this is ongoing too. You're continually doing this over time as you're doing this. So uh, for, I've already mentioned to you, I want you to be familiar with what human resource management is. I'd also like you to be familiar with these steps in determining your human resource needs. Now I'm gonna go through them kind of quickly and then I'm gonna move back on, a, on one or two of them that I, I wanna spend a little time on. Preparing your human, human resource inventory. Before you go out and start looking, do you know what you, do you, do you, should you know what you've got? Hey, uh, Fred, how about picking up some copy paper uh, when you go to uh, go out at lunch? Well, okay, but before Fred goes out to pick up copy paper, do we have any? How much do we need? Well, how much we, we need kind of depends on how much we, we have. So you always want to, you know, prepare a human resource inventory. You know, who do you have, what do they do, what skills do they have, what education. Um, I'll mention this, we teach a great class here in our, in our business and technology department. It's called Small Business Management, Business 190. Uh, I taught that course for several, several years and then I ended up teaching personal finance and some things, that I, some other classes that we brought in to teach. And it just got to the point where I, I couldn't teach all the classes that needed to be taught. So we had to find somebody, we had to find somebody to teach um, small business management. So the idea is I wonder where we're going to find that person. But well, one of the things, of course, you know, we did, 
we looked at our human resource inventory. We looked at the people already here at Delta. And any of you have ever had a Professor Brian Dunn, Professor Brian Dunn is a great math professor. I think he does mostly the developmental math. But he also has spent about 10 years plus in the, he's a veteran, thank you for that Brian, and he also spent about 10 years plus in the corporate world. And he's done some things with his own business and so he has a master's degree in business. He was very, very qualified to teach small business management. So we approached him and said, would you consider teaching small business management? And he said, hey, I love math. But you know, I have a business background. It would be something, you know, we talked about job enlargement or job enrichment. Hey, this is something I can do that's almost gonna be fun. So I don't know for the last 10 years, I guess, he's probably been teaching small business management. Does a great job with it. Okay, so the first thing you have to do to determine your human resource, uh, uh, in, in determining your human resource needs, prepare a human resource, uh, human resource inventory. Prepare a job analysis. I'm gonna come back to that. Assess future HR needs. What are your future needs by department, by area? How much am I gonna need in this area? Hey, maybe we're gonna expand. We're gonna move out into a different area. What are we gonna need there? So make sure that you assess all the different needs that you either have now or you're going to have to include maybe some of the goals of your company that's gonna be moving you into a direction where you have a whole new set of human resource needs. Assess the need. Then assess the future supply. What's the supply of people? What's the availability of people in that area? Then come up with a plan. Now, should you be doing this on an ongoing basis? Yes, and if you're doing these first four on an ongoing basis, maybe should your strategic plan maybe change over time? Yeah, depending on what your needs are. All right, I wanna spend a few minutes on a job analysis. Preparing a job analysis leads to preparing two other documents. A job description and a job specification. So when you prepare a job description, that leads you to, or, or in preparing a job description, you prepare, a, uh, in preparing a job analysis, you prepare a job description and a job specification. What is a job description? And a few of you said, it's a description of the job. And you're right. It describes what the job is. It tells what the major tasks are of that job. Here's what that job is all about. Here's what that job does. Here's the description of the job. Could the job description ever change in a job? It could, couldn't it? It could. If a job changes, the job description should change because the job description is what describes the task in a job. Okay, which jobs should have a job description? If you said all of them, you're correct. Because if you've got to go out and find somebody to fill a job, you got to know what that job is. What does that job do? What are the tasks? What's a job specification? The specification for the job, what does that mean? Well, the job description, and you probably have already told me, the job description talks about the job. The job specification talks about, in essence, the person or actually the skills, let me use a better term, the requirements for the person that's gonna have that job. What, what education do they need? What skills do they need? What experience do they need? What this, that, or the other do they need? What are the qualifications that we're looking for for a person to be able to do this job? What jobs <coughs> need a job specification? Same answer. Look, you can't do this 
if you ain't got this. If you don't know what you're looking for, and you don't know what it takes to do it, you can't do this. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. So I would be familiar with the steps in determining uh, human resource needs, and I'd be familiar with what a job description is, I'd be familiar with what a job specification is. Okay, I think I'm gonna leave this up here, but I'll move this, <coughs> job description, job specification. <coughs> Excuse me. Now let's talk about, let's talk about going through here. Uh, if you look at my study notes, I call this something a little bit different. My study notes call this recruitment. Recruitment. I call it finding. What is recruiting? What is recruiting? It's simply finding the right people at the right time. The right people at the right time and the right number. I get the right number, you know, how many do I need? One, two, three, five. The right people, the right number at the right time. That's what recruitment is. Once I've determined that I have a need, I've got to go out and recruit. Okay. Um, how can you recruit? Did I write that down on the handout at all? Yeah, I did. Good for me. There's two basic ways you can recruit, internally or externally. Now let's talk about internal recruitment. It, it was kind of like Professor Brian Dunn, when he took the, the job, uh, uh, the, the course, small business management, we recruited from within. We found someone uh, that was very well qualified to teach that, uh, and he agreed to teach it and some additional, additional compensation to do that. Uh, if your company, you know, a lot of, one of the real motivating things about a company is that if, if you have, your employees have the opportunity for promotion, you know, if you go to work for a company and you know, hey, look, I love this job, but I'd like to move up, it's motivating that you might be able to get promoted. So if your company promotes from within. So it may well be that when you're trying to fill a job, you may need to, you can fill that by promoting someone from within or moving someone from some other area into that position. So you can, you can do internal recruiting. Hey, if you can find somebody internally Again, I'll go back to, to Professor Dunn. I mean, he was already here at Delta. He was already doing a great job. He already knew all about Delta and all, of, all the workings of Delta. So for him to slide in and teach that class just worked perfectly. I think it worked well for him and it was great for, it was great for Delta Community College. Uh, so you, you know, that's the way that you can, uh, uh, and, so, and let's say sometimes, let's say that you're recruiting for a new area a new initiative that your company's taking, but you're also having to cut back in another area. You might be able to recruit from in, within some of these folks that, that may or, are not going to continue with a job because of th their areas being phased out. You might retrain them and move them in this other job, the other, other job. Now externally, how do you recruit externally? Social media, the internet, huge way to do it in this day and time. And of course, how you recruit externally depends on the job. If you were recruiting to hire a new chancellor at Delta Community College, you would recruit differently if you were, you were trying to find someone a, as an employee at Academy. Different types of jobs are going to be recruited different ways. Uh, external recruitment, they, the, some people still use the newspaper, you know, they still have those things. TV, radio, Again, uh, the internet, uh, more and more applications, more and more things are now being done by way of the internet. Right. What else did I put down here? Oh, um, 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 job fairs. A lot of companies will recruit uh, public employment agencies, private employment agencies. Let me put a plug in for you here. Uh, if we ever get back to the new normal and we can be here at Delta, we have job fairs. We have businesses to come out here and talk to students about their businesses and the possibility of employment in their businesses. You should always attend those job fairs. Oh, but I'm not looking for a job right now. It doesn't matter. I think I know where I'm going to work the rest of my life. It doesn't matter. 
it's great for you to go out there and see what businesses are looking for. If a job fair comes here, you know, your job here at Delta is to end up with an education and an experience that's going to make you more attractive in the workforce. Isn't that right? Uh, let's say that there's a really good job that's being offered somewhere here in the Monroe West Monroe area, and this is where you want to stay. You want to stay in this area, at least for now. And there's this really nice job. It's got a good salary, it's a good position, seems like it has good benefits. You really like the idea of that job. I'm going to apply for that job. You think you're going to be the only person that applies? Mm -mm. Probably going to be 25 others that are going to apply for that job. Now I'm jumping ahead of myself, but I'm going to get back. That company is going to go through a selection process. They got 25 people that they have that they can choose from. You really want that job. For you to get that job, you've got to stand out. You've got to be different. You've got to have more experience, more bells, more whistles. You've got to be able to present yourself where you stand out. Now, doing things like attending job fairs, what I would do when a job fair comes, if I'm a student, I'd get dressed up reasonably nicely. I'd put together a resume. Uh, Julie Salter down in Career Services will help you with, with a resume. And I'd go and I'd talk to those people. I'd talk to everybody that was there that you had any remote interest in. And get the experience of talking with employers and that sort of thing. Uh, it, it helps you. Hey, you may find something that's really good. But it's, it's a part of your education here is to do things like that. You're missing an opportunity if you don't do that. I'll tell you something else, and I'll, and I'll get off of this tangent, but it's important. You can get this degree in business and technology, which is a lot of you are in, or if you're in general studies uh, with a business concentration, you know, or you may at some point say, you know, I, instead of general studies with a business concentration, maybe I want to go pure business. We'd love to have you do that. But there's some other things you you can get some certified you can get certified in, in all of our in our in all of our you know Microsoft Office Microsoft Word all that. you can get industry based certifications you can get certified in customer service here I think there are about ten or twelve different certifications or certificate type things you can get here at Delta as you go through and get your higher education associate applied science degree if you do if you want if you want to do that if you're looking to do that All right. so what am I saying hey I'm leaving Delta Community College with an associate degree I have a higher education degree I've also got eight different certifications here uh, I've been going to job fairs and I've been honing my skills with how to talk with employers and things. Also, you're going to find uh, here from time to time, we'll do dress for success type meetings or, or get togethers for students, uh, interviewing skill seminars that you can attend here, a resume writing. You need to take advantage of all that stuff. You need to look different. You need to stand out. When somebody looks at your resume, it's like, wow. I mean, I don't want to be negative here, but let me make this statement. If you get through here with a C minus average and you don't do anything special, you're not going to stand out. Now, are you going to be able to get a job? Yes. Are you going to be able to get a decent job because you have a higher education degree? Yes. But are you going to get that special job? There's 25 of them. What makes you different? Okay, that's, that's a sermonette on that. That's important stuff. Uh, but, but again, recruiting, you can recruit internally, you can re recruit externally. Recruiting is finding the right number of the right people at the right time. Selection. What, and I want you to be familiar with what recruitment is. Okay, selection, I want you to be familiar with what selection is. Deciding who is to be hired. Uh, I, we've recruited 25 people, but we only need three. Who are we going to select? as a company. Out of those 25, we've already talked a little bit about that, but who are we going to select? So that's what the selection process is. It is choosing the right person.
person or persons for that job. A lot, and I want you to be familiar with that. A lot of it has to do with fit. You need to be the right fit. Is this person the right fit for our organization? And if you as, an, if you as a prospective employee, you're thinking, am I the right fit? Does this company feel good for me? Do I feel like this is the kind of place I want to work? And the company is saying, hey, is this the kind of person we want to work here? <laughs> so fit is really, really important. That's why when you, you know, if you're really going for something, you, you, hone, those, you, you, you hone those interview skills and everything, you can let employers know, hey, I want to be a part of this. I want to fit here, if you truly do. All right. So that's what selection is. Now, when we talk about selection, deciding the, who to be hired, the best for the individual, best for the organization, if you take, now I have to do it, since I'm holding my sheet, I have to turn my sheet sideways, and there is a selection process. Here's how selection normally goes. I'd like for you to be familiar with these steps in selection. Just like I'd like for you to be familiar with how you determine your human resource needs, I'd like for you to be familiar with these steps in selection. Let's look at them. Matter of fact, I'll do that. I'll just sit down here and rest as I'm doing it as we go through these. Be familiar with it. Step number one in a typical selection process. We got, let's just say we had 25 applicants and we got three positions. So we got to eliminate, uh, we got to eliminate 22 people. We want the three best, the three best fit. Obtain a complete application. All right. So you want to get a complete application from that employee. That's probably going to be, be received online. Uh, <clears throat> when, you, when you go out to recruit, should you let the people know what the job is? Of course. In other words, you should, when you recruit, you should have the job description as a part of the recruiting effort so the individual knows what the job is. Also, should you have the job, the job specifications, the skills you're looking for. Here's the job and here's the skills, here's what we want. Must have a an associate degree or higher must have basic computer skills, preferable three years of experience, yada, yada, yada. Okay, you get the applications in. When you go through the applications, <clears throat> If a person does not have at least a, an associate degree, should you put those applications aside and not consider them? Well, hey, I see this one application here. Uh, they, they have some really good, I see they have, they have some good experience here. And uh, oh, I, they mentioned something about they like to hunt and fish, and I like to do that too. And they sure are cute, or they really are handsome, or you know, uh, maybe we, no, no. If they don't meet the requirements of job specification, set them aside. Why? Who made up the rules? Who made up the rules? You did, the company did. Here's what the company said, you must have this, you must have this. Now, if the person only had two years of experience and you said three years of experience preferred, that's okay, you could include them because that was a preference. But if these things you say you must have this, must have this, must have this, then you need to set those aside. Why? Because you can get in trouble. If, if, if you hire me and I don't meet the minimum qualifications and Tom or Nancy over here finds out about it, can they file a grievance against you? Yes, they can. Do they have a good chance of winning? I think so, if they get a good attorney. Because you broke your own rules. You broke your own rules. All right. So make sure that, that uh, you know, you can weed out. We might be able to weed out uh, half of those people simply by the, uh, the application. All right. Number two, conduct initial and follow-up interviews. You get to see the person. You get to see the person in initial and follow-up interviews. 
You know, how can, that's more that's more that interviewing like you've done with these job fairs. Because you're going to be nervous. But you're going to be less nervous and more prepared if you've been doing some interviewing already. Uh, give employment tests. Is it okay to give employment tests? Yes. As long as the employment test, as long as a good job on the test relates to a good, a, a good job on the job. Good performance on the test should equal good performance on the job. I always use this silly example. I'm a runner. I like to run. I like to race. I do 5Ks, 10Ks. I have done marathons. Not lately. Um, so if we're going to hire somebody in the business and technology program here, I'd like for them to hire somebody that can run five miles with me. And uh, so I, I want that to be one of the requirements. Well, no. You can be a jam up good business and technology professor and not run five miles. So that test is not valid. A conducted background in, in, uh, investigation, sure. Uh, normally on application, you're going to have some. You're going to have some references where you can do some background investigations. A hint to you, as as someone who's uh, looking for a job, make sure you've told that person you've gotten permission to use them as a reference. And if you if you ask them that you're going to use them for a reference, and maybe a year has gone by, and all of a sudden you're getting ready to change jobs or something, and you're applying for a job, call them again. Make sure that they're still okay with you you being you using them as a reference, and that they someone may be calling you pretty soon, and you might want to update them on what's going on in your life. That can help them be a better reference. Uh, physical exams. Uh, it's perfectly okay to, you know, physical exams are going to be a part of the selection process. Now, physical exams should, should happen at the time of hiring. You don't, want to, you don't want to pay for a doctor doing physical exams on 25 people. You want to pay for the, the, the doctor doing the physical exam on three people that you are offering a hiring contract to. Of course, a part of the physical, the physical exam is going to be the drug screen, and then also a general physical uh, lets you know the, uh, the health of that person in case there's ever a, a worker's comp claim, an injury on the job. Uh, and then establish a probationary period. Now, I'm, I'm maybe taking a little more, more time on these than I should, but I want you to be familiar with these six steps. What is a probationary period? Usually it's a period of time, 30, 60, 90 days, normally never over 90 days, where, look, you've got the person's application, you've interviewed the person, you've done a background check, uh, you've given that person an employment test, uh, they've passed the physical, but you actually hadn't seen them on the job. They look great on paper. They look great in conversation, but we really don't know how they're going to do on the job. So what that says is for, let's say, 60 days, you're going to be working on a probationary period for 60 days. During the 60-day period of time, if for some reason you don't seem to be the right fit, we, we don't feel like we really want you in the organization, we can simply say, go away. We can pay you for the time that you've worked and say we no longer care for your service. Uh, you don't have to tell them why. You, know, you just say, no thank you. We decided not to continue your employment. You do it nice. You know. you say, well, what, what, so what's the difference? Well, here's the difference. After the 60-day probationary period, that employee has all the rights granted to all other employees, whether they've been there for one year or ten years, as it relates to employment rights. Normally, if you're going to terminate somebody, you have to do what they call progressive discipline. You know, uh, you have to do a probably an informal type uh, thing, maybe a, a, uh, a uh, just a counseling session, and then a uh, uh, an informal uh, reprimand. Then maybe a written reprimand. Then uh, suspension. Before you have to go through a number of things before you can terminate. Even if you terminate somebody, they normally have a grievance procedure where they can file and they can go through the procedure as a part of, of, of the process of them being terminated. They have termination rights, and they should. But during the first 60 days, you basically waive those rights during a probationary period. Uh, they, they, if you tell them during that time, we don't want you anymore, it's just simply a separation. You know, it gives you that opportunity to see them on the job before you totally commit to them probationary period. All right, uh, so what we've done, we have, uh, uh, we have gotten through the, the, uh, the finding of
internal, external recruitment. Uh, we've looked at selection, the six-step process, you know, and then we actually hire the person. You know, we actually make the hire offer for that person. Along with that hiring comes uh, the physical exam. Now, here's what I think: hiring should be formal. There should be a formal contract. When you hire that employee, there should be a formal. Now, HR is going to have some documents and stuff you have to sign and all that sort of thing. But as a part of that, there should be a formal contract that says, you know, here at Delta, I sign a contract every year. And this, you know, it tells me, you know, what my salary is, what my contract year starts, when my contract year ends, all that kind of stuff. I think to that formal contract, a copy of the job description and a copy of the job specification should be attached to it. And I think that should go in your HR files, and I think you should have a copy of that as well. So hiring should be a, a formal type thing. Uh, now, you know, Joe, you're going to be making, uh, you're going to be making uh, 46000 a year. 46? I thought it was 64. Well, whether the four comes first or the six comes first makes a lot of difference. So let's make sure we understand the salary, the benefits, make, make sure we understand all of that going in. So I think hiring should be a, like I say, should be a, a, formal, a formal process. Now, on your handout, it looks like I blacked out some stuff. But that's not really what I meant to do. I was highlighting it, but I highlighted it dark enough you can't see it. So what I wanted to talk to you about right at this point was something called contingency. Contingency workers or contingency employees. I, I want you to be familiar with, just like I wanted you to be familiar with the six steps in the selection process, I want you to be familiar with what contingency employees are. We also call those folks part-time employees. You know about 25 plus percent of our total workforce in America is part-time or contingency worker? Uh, why is that? Well, one of the reasons is most times contingency workers uh, are more flexible. Contingency workers aren't paid the benefits that full-time employees are paid. But I just want you to be, you know, know that uh, I'm going to say no regular job expectations. I'll get out from in front of the camera. No regular job expectations. I want you to be familiar with that. That's what contingency workers are. Uh, part time, and a lot of times it works great for it works great for employees. You're, you're going to school, and some of you have a lot of you have jobs, and a lot of your jobs are not part full time jobs. They're part time jobs, and your employer helps you by working around your schedule. So you would be in essence a contingency worker. Works good for you to have that employment. Works good for them to have somebody like you that can work on a part-time basis, flexible basis with them. Okay. Let me mention one more thing about contingency of part-time workers. We would be in serious trouble here at Delta in our business school if we didn't have some contingency workers. We call these adjunct or part-time professors. Uh, to get an Associate of, uh, of Applied Science, an AAS, AAS degree in Business and Technology here at Delta, uh, that's a higher education degree. You have to have certain classes. And the people that teach those classes have to meet certain qualifications. We're all a part of the Southern Association of, of Colleges and Schools accreditation. We have to have the same minimum, uh, here at Delta, we have to have the same minimum educational requirements as they do at Tech, Grambling, or ULM. Okay. One of the classes we teach here is business law. Another class we teach here, which is required of you, another one that we teach here is uh, accounting, principles of financial accounting. All right. We don't have a full-time faculty member here at Delta that is qualified to teach accounting. To teach accounting, you have to have 18 graduate hours in accounting, you have to have a CPA, or 18 graduate hours, you have to have a lot of accounting. Uh, none of us have that much accounting because that's not what our degrees were not in accounting. But we have uh, Carolyn Brazier. She is an adjunct instructor with us that teaches accounting. 
She is a CPA. She has all the qualifications and more that she needs to teach accounting and that that qualify as a as a course. If we didn't have someone that that had that, we could not offer we could not grant a degree if we wouldn't have a person qualified to teach that course. Uh, business law. To teach business law, uh, you have to be an attorney. You have to be a licensed practicing attorney in the state of Louisiana. Uh, our business law teacher, I'm very fond of our business law teacher, as a matter of fact. Uh, I think I love her. Uh, okay, all right, now, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting weird. My daughter teaches the business law classes here at Delta. She is a practicing attorney here in this area. She's a law school graduate, meets all the qualifications. None of us on staff have that. So what I'm saying is our contingency employees, or as we call them, adjunct uh, professors, are they important to us here at Delta? Wow, I'll say it allows, us to, it allows us to have and be able to offer these degree programs. Okay. Uh, and I guess that was a, a, a plug for, for my daughter. You'll, you'll love business law. Business 231 is a required course, but you'll enjoy it. Also, you, you'll enjoy it. Now, accounting is accounting's kind of like law. It's a whole new stuff. And you can't just go in and say, well, I'm just going to kind of yawn my way through those classes. Well, you shouldn't yawn your way through any of them, but you sure don't want those. Uh, make sure you really stay focused and you'll do a great job and really learn some good stuff. Okay, uh, training. Let me get the contingency workers out of here. I do want you to be familiar with what contingency workers are. Here's what I want you to be familiar with about training. What kind of training should employees do? I have no idea. It depends on the employee. It depends on what they do. There's on-the-job training, there's apprenticeship training, there's vestibule training, there's mentoring type training, there's formal educational type college degree. I mean, you know, here's, a, here's what I do know. Training for an employee should begin when they first go to work. Normally that's called, oh, orientation. And training should continue as long as they're a part of your organization. Uh, we have to do continuing uh, development, of, uh, uh, professional development each year, so many hours here at Delta. Why do you do training of employees? Why do companies do training of employees? To improve their performance, to keep their skills up, to keep their skills current, and improve their performance. I'd be familiar with that. Okay. Um, I think the way I'm doing this, I can turn the back side of this page. All right, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this. Let's talk about evaluating or appraising employees. That's what, that's what supervisors do. They appraise or evaluate their employees. Now, on your handout, again, I cut off the top, I'm sorry. But you see something here, it says, establish performance standards, communicate those standards, evaluate performance. If you can find where I am on your study notes. All right. Here's just a couple of things that I want to say about appraisal or evaluating. Uh, why do you do appraisals or evaluations of your employees? Same reason. To improve their performance. That's the primary reason. So the uh, kind of a be familiar with here. The main reason you do and continue to do training of your employees is to improve their performance. The reason that you evaluate or praise your employees is continually to improve their performance. New things and that sort of thing. One other thing about, about evaluations. Now if you look at if you look at that list do you see the first thing that's on that list? Establish performance standards. Before you can evaluate someone, you have to establish the standards that they are supposed to meet. Does that make sense? Now let me see if anybody can really, really, really get deep in here with me. The performance standards, the standards that you you as a business, perhaps the supervisor, set up for that job. 
If that person meets these standards, doom, 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 then they're doing a good job. Where do you think those standards should come from? Job description. Remember the job description describes the task that the, the employees should perform? From that job description, you should lift out two, three, five, six, whatever standards that your employees should meet to be doing a good job with that job. So I want you to be familiar with this. You cannot appraise an employee until you establish standards. The first step in appraising an employee is to establish performance standards. If you ain't got no standards, you don't know how good a job they're doing and you can't measure it. If any of you are golfers in here, you go out to a golf course, you want to know what's par on the course, what's par on the hole. Is this a par three, a par four, whatever. If you go to a golf course, there's no pars. What's the par for this course? There ain't one. Hey, what's the par for this hole? Don't have one. So I shot a four on this hole. What is that? It's a four. Is that good or bad? Well, it's a four. There's no standard. You see what I'm saying? Uh, well, if it was a par three, then you bogeyed the hole. That's the idea. So, so real back again. You train people and you appraise or evaluate people to improve their performance. Appraisal, when you appraise a person, appraisal of a person starts first with establishing performance standards for that job. All right, that's enough. Compensating employees, we talked about that. Now that's part of retention. Let me clean this up a little bit. As we're talking about compensation, remember that, that's, what, that's one of those things that motivates people. And we're talking about that. If we're talking about that, we're in the we're in kind of down in here. Compensation. Let's talk a little bit about compensation, maybe benefits. Uh, good stuff. All right. There's really about four major ways that people are compensated like for you to be familiar with. Uh, let's not bore you with, a, with too much of one color. Let's go with this. Salary. Uh, this may not be on your handout. So, hourly wage. Peace rate. P I. E C E R A T. I think that's right. That's close. Uh, and commission. I think I want to do a good job on spelling these. Let me double check. See if I'm see if I'm right. Uh, yeah. I think you did call it peace work instead of peace rate. Alright, I want you to be familiar with these four types of, or four ways that people are compensated. And you, you, you are familiar with what salary is. It's so much per month, so much per year. Your salary is $50,000 a year, that would be a salary. As you work, you're going to pay. Or your salary is uh, uh, sixty thousand dollars a year, or your salary is five thousand dollars a month. So that's we know what a salary is. That's a fixed amount of compensation for a period of time. Hourly wage. That's pretty simple. So much per hour. You make fourteen dollars an hour. You make sixteen dollars an hour worked. Peace work, that's back, that, that was that thing, you know, they used to do back more, more, not as nearly as much now as back during Frederick Taylor's time, where you got paid by your production. Peace work is where you get paid by the amount of your production, by the amount of product that you produce. 
That's piece work. It's not, how, it's not a fixed salary. It's not an amount per hour you're in the building. It's by your productivity. And then I think you probably commission is normally a percentage of sales. A lot of times people that, are, that do sales, they get paid on a percentage of what they sell. If you're selling vehicles, if you're selling furniture, if you're selling appliances, uh, you're selling computers, whatever it is that you're selling, uh, you, get, you get paid for a percentage of that sale. Maybe you get 3% of all that you sell. Now sometimes you can do a combination. They may give you a salary plus commission. That means in your job you're going to get a salary of $24,000 a year, which is not huge, but then you're going to get 3% of your sales. I want you to be familiar with salary, hourly wage, piece work, uh, and commission. Okay, piece work, piece rate, piece mail, that sort of thing. Okay. And then he talks about a couple of other things in here. Fringe benefits. Now I'd love to have you in class with me right now because that's one of the questions I ask is, what fringe benefit, if you, if you had a job, and you've been talking to them about salary, and you said, okay, this is the salary I want, you negotiated, and you've said, okay, I've got my salary now. And then that employer looked at you and said, okay, you can have one fringe benefit. What do you want? What would that fringe benefit be? And that also, of course, makes us understand what are, excuse me, what are uh, fringe benefits. What are fringe benefits? Um, vacation pay or, or paid vacation, would that be a fringe benefit? What about health insurance? I tell you, I teach a course called personal finance. How you can increase your wealth during your, your work career. Health care is costly. I tell students this, the one thing you don't want is to have to pay out of pocket for your health care. Because a bill can go to two, three, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 like that. And it can go into the thousands. So you've got to have some way to cover health care expenses. If you've got a rich uncle who's a doctor and a multimillionaire and he owns his own hospital and team of doctors and he says, hey, I'll take care of you forever and ever, then you've, you've got to take care of. If you don't, you've got to have some way to make sure that your health care, you do not have to pay for the vast majority of it yourself. The, the way that most of us handle that is through health insurance. So companies that offer a health insurance benefit uh, offer you health insurance and maybe even health insurance for you and your family at a reduced rate or something like that. That's pretty important stuff. Okay, so fringe benefits. Health insurance, life insurance, paid vacation, sick leave. Do you want to work till you die? Nah, maybe I want to retire. Okay, what do you want to do when you retire? Fun stuff, travel, hunt, fish, shop, I don't know. Well, do you want to live, how do you want to live when you retire? Semi-poverty? No, I want to live really good. So you've got to prepare a retirement. 401k plans are, are plans that companies uh, provide that helps you with retirement. So it may be important that a 401k plan may be a benefit you're really looking for. Uh, how about your own automobile with a gas card? Okay, so I just want you to be familiar with what fringe benefits are and kind of some of the examples that we talked about. Something else that's on your handout is, flex. now all of these really have to do with this retention thing. It's something called flex time. Some jobs, you can't have really too much flex time. If you work for a retail company that works, that, that opens up at eight o'clock in the morning and closes at five o'clock in the afternoon, there may not be a, a lot of opportunity for flex time, but there may be some. But you may have another company that says, that says this, that you're working for a kind of company that says, during the week, 
between the hours of six o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the evening, you have to put in during the week 40 hours. Whoa. Does that mean I could go to work at six and get off? Does that mean I could do some of it on Saturday or Sunday? I don't recommend that. You know? But in other words, a lot of flexibility. Flex time has kind of gotten to be a, 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 something that, that you know, people like. If they can be flexible in their work, a lot of us are working from home. You know, and that kind of gives you some flex time. So another thing that's kind of I want you to be familiar with is this possibility of flex time on your job. All right. I think that's most of the things as it, as it relates that I wanted to I wanted to uh, to mention. Uh, yeah, fringe benefits. Be familiar with with fringe benefits. Be familiar with uh, flex time. Be familiar with these different types of uh, of compensations. Now the last thing in this chapter is this. When you're looking at human resource management, let me see what color I want to use here. I think I'll use the blue because it's pretty bold. Let me put this word up here. Can you read it through all this other stuff? Legal. There's a lot of legal things as it relates to Recruiting, selecting, hiring, evaluating, retaining. There's a lot of legal things that relates to human resource management. Human resource departments have to be very much up on legal matters. What is legal or illegal as it relates to your selecting, hiring, or your employment of people. There's a lot of laws out there that are important. And uh, I don't, I don't, not sure, yeah, oh yeah, a matter of fact, I, in your notes, I gave you this sheet. It's the last sheet uh, in your, your chapter study notes for unit number two. Look at all these laws. And that's just, that's just the beginning. There's a lot more laws than these laws that relate to how do you manage your human resources. Now, what I want to do is, and I know you're holding your breath, how far is he going to go with this? Well, if you're looking at the sheet, you can already tell. You see that T2 by three of those laws? I wonder if that T2 stands for test two? Huh, I bet it does. So I bet you of all these laws, I bet you there's three on here that I particularly want you to be familiar with. And so let's look at those. But, but I, I'm glancing down through here. Now these are just, just I happen to see Americans with Disabilities, Americans with Disabilities Acts of 1990. You cannot discriminate against a person who has a disability just because they have a disability. I'm not going to hire that person. Why? Because they're in a wheelchair. Mm. American with Disabilities Act. All kinds of disabilities. Uh, AIDS. Hepatitis. Uh, can you discriminate? You can't discriminate. That's a whole different law, but, but that, that, I'm not going to really talk much about that one. Older, worker be, older Workers Benefit Protection Act. Those old people? Those old people over 60? They got some special protections. Wow. Uh, Family and Medical Leave Act. That's another big act. Uh, people have the right to take off. Uh, Businesses with 50 or more employees must, must provide up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave per year upon birth or adoption of an employee's child or upon serious illness of a parent, spouse, or child. Okay. Uh, okay, let's go to the three that I want you to be familiar with. Number one, the National Labor Relations Act the most important piece of labor legislation passed in the history of the world. What? The most important piece of labor legislation 
human resource management legislation passed in the history of the world. It was passed in 1935. It gave employees the right to form and join unions. And the right to form and join unions changed the landscape of business in America. Unions changed the landscape of business in America. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the next chapter, chapter 12, will have a whole chapter on unions. So I'll just stop with that. I want you to be familiar with the National Labor Relations Act, also, also called the Wagner Act. And that was the right, that, that was the act that gave people the right to form and join unions. Fair Labor Standards Act. The Fair Labor Standards Act, 1938. Hey, these two things were passed in the 1930s. <coughs> what was going on in the 1930s? The Great Depression. Great Depression. In 1938, the Fair Labor Standards Act set minimum wage and overtime provisions for most workers in America. There are some workers that are exempt from overtime, minimum wage, but the vast majority of Americans fall under minimum wage and overtime provisions. Uh, that, was, that was huge. That was a huge piece of legislation for employees. Are you saying sometimes they, pay, they, would, uh, they would pay people dirt cheap? Yep. And work them long, 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 long hours? Yep. Okay. Establish a minimum wage and overtime pay for employees working more than 40 hours a week. Overtime is determined by 40 hours per week. If you work a person over 40 hours per week, you have to pay them at least time and a half. Minimum wage. Most jobs, certainly most hourly jobs, are subject to minimum wage. You know what the first minimum wage was in 1938? 25 cents. 25 cents. Okay, the, the third one. The Civil Rights Act of 1964. Oh yeah, that's that act that has to do about, about primarily about discriminating against Afro-Americans and things, and it was back in the 60s and 70s, and we, well, yes, you're right, but the, the Civil Rights Act of 19 of 1964 as amended is much, much broader than that. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 made discrimination illegal. Let me read it. For firms of 15 or more employees outlined discrimination in employment based on sex, race, religion, color, national origin. Uh, it's been included now sexual orientation. It makes basically discrimination illegal. Also, as it's been amended, uh, sexual harassment, if you get charged with sexual harassment, uh, sexual harassment is, is the, they will charge you with sexual harassment out of Title VII of, of, uh, of the Civil Rights Act. So the Civil Rights Act is incredibly broad. Let me talk a minute, you know we're almost through, but just hang in here. You, when you fill out an application, if an employer puts on that application things like age, marital status, religious preference, race, ethnicity, should they put those things on an application? No, they're illegal. It's illegal to put them on there. I know some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, it's, it's, it's illegal. Why do you have to know if a person's a Baptist or a Methodist? Why do you have to know if a person's male or female? So you can discriminate? I'm not going to hire any woman for that job. I'm not going to hire a man for that job. Yeah. I, I'm not going to hire a Hispanic. That's discrimination. It, it, first of all, it's wrong. But then secondly, it's illegal. So, but I, I've, I've seen age on an application before. What you should have seen is this. Are you 18 years of age or older? That's okay. I mean, because you've got to be 18 to do the job. Another thing, and I won't, again, won't get too, too strong out. Can you put on an application? You ever been arrested? Shouldn't. You shouldn't. You should put on that application. Have you ever pled guilty to or been convicted of a felony? Yada, 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 yada. Because that's public record. So. What should, you know, back to an application. What should an application tell you about that person? It should tell you about their 
education, their skills, and their experiences. Same thing in a job interview. Now look, when a person walks in for a job interview, you probably got a pretty good chance to know whether they're male or female, okay? All right, understand that. And that's okay. You know, they don't, you don't bring them in with a mask so you can't tell. That's okay to know that. That's just going to come natural. But you can't ask them in a, uh, in a job interview the things you can't ask them on an application. Hey, are you married? Are you going to have any, are you, are you having, are you having children? Are you planning on having children? You can't ask those questions. Because why are you saying that? Because I want to hire you or don't want to hire you if you're married. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, if you've got kids, that means you're not going to be able to come to work sometimes because they're sick. I, you know, those are discriminatory things. Okay. So I just want you to be, I'm sorry, I just got off on a mini tangent there, but it's important stuff. And it's the kind of stuff these folks have got to be careful with. As they go through finding and selecting and hiring the best folks, they can't let discriminatory things enter into this. Or if they do uh, and found out about it, it's going to create problems. Uh, same thing with promotion of people. Okay, okay, enough of that. I want you to be familiar with uh, Th those three, those three pieces of legislation. Just what we, just what we mentioned as we talked about it. All right. Um, Civil Rights Act prohibits discrimination in employment. Uh, Fair Labor Standards Act uh, deals with minimum wage and overtime. Uh, and the uh, Wagner Act or Fair Labor Standards, uh, 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 the Wagner Act or the uh, National Labor Relations Act, form the right to form and join unions. Okay, that is Chapter Eleven. We have now covered the management chapters. So what's coming up next is test number two. Remember, test two is, you, you, now, you, I expect you, however well you did on test one, I expect you to do better on test two, because you've got me figured out. You've kind of been able to figure out my notes. Some of them are a little tacky, I realize that, but we're doing okay with them. Uh, you, you've got my notes figured out. Uh, you know what my tests are like. Definitions, true, false, multiple choice, matching, fill in the blank. You know what no stuff is. You know what be familiar with stuff is. So I want you to do a really, really great job on test number two. Once you finish test number two, you are halfway through this summer semester. Okay? All right, so I think that's it. I think that's all I needed to say about, about this. So I'll do my, uh, I guess that's Forrest Gump. Wasn't, it, wasn't that his line? That's all I have to say about that? Okay. Well, I need to do the loud clap for my executive producer, Ryan Pierce, uh, to show that we have finished, uh, we have finished chapter 11. Uh, you'll, be taking, uh, you'll be taking test number two, and then we'll be heading to uh, chapter 12 and moving into unit 13. Good luck on that test.